When I was six years old, I went to my father and I said, Dad, I want to buy this toy. And he said, no, I'm not going to give you the money for the toy. And I said, come on, Dad. And he went, no. He put his hand in the air, yelled in that big, thick accent. And when the hand goes in the air, that's it. End of discussion. And I was so upset. I decided uh, it was time for me to leave the family at six years old. <laughs> and I decided I was going to run away. And I took my green toolbox and I put in there a change of underwear and some Pop Rocks candy. And I went out the front door and I sat in the front yard in the bushes and I waited and waited. And four hours later, I was out of food. It was getting dark and I was afraid I was going to have to use that change of underwear. And so uh, I surrendered and I admitted defeat and I went back inside and I never got that toy. Well. 45 years later, I am now the CEO of perhaps the most high-tech toy company in the world called Sphero. And we make a bunch of amazing, cool products. Uh, a lot of them are robotic, and they teach kids uh, you know, how to program and science and art and math. And it's just a really a wonderful business to be part of. And we all know that play is actually pretty important, being humans. Uh, when we're young, we start to learn about creativity and our imagination. We learn how to engage with others. And as a society, this is also how we learn. We, we become creative uh, and develop and advance. All the wonderful marvels of the world that are technologically based start uh, with creative thinking, and creative thinking starts with creative play. Well, it turns out kids are playing less these days. In, uh, from 1981 till now, playtime is down by over 25%. And that's, uh, that's problematic, because our kids are not learning to be critical thinkers. So this is me, age 14. Um, I never did get that toy, but I did get an Apple II computer in 1980. And uh, you may ask, why would my dad not buy me a toy, but he'll buy me a computer? Well, that's how he thought. Um, he believed in education, he believed in technology, and he felt that if a child could learn a skill, he would never be beholden to anyone. In fact, my father never even got me a Christmas gift. He would go out and buy me whatever I wanted, so long as it was educational. So I had things like Erector sets and Lego and uh, model railroads that I broke all the time, and computers, and microscopes and telescopes, and it was fantastic growing up. And so why would my dad think like this? Well, he came to the States in 1955. He didn't have a high school degree, he didn't speak English, but he hustled, and he learned, and he developed a skill that no one could take away from him. And he got a degree in accounting, became a CPA, and then a successful businessman. And he lived the American dream. Now, I mentioned that kids are playing less. Well, it turns out we actually track this. We track this in what's called the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking. And we track it across all of America with over 300,000 kids. And they track many dimensions. But let's just pick these three. Fluency, a kid's given a problem, how many ideas does he come up with? Originality, okay, of the ideas he comes up to solve the problem, how many of them are unique, and of course, Elaboration, what's the depth of those solutions? Across all three, they're down. There's many reasons, but we can tie a lot of it back to creative play. Why, do we, why is this important? Well, for many of the careers that our kids will pursue, there's a high degree of correlation between success as, let's say, an entrepreneur or a scientist or an artist or even mathematician between creative thinking and success in these fields. And this is important because the jobs of tomorrow don't exist yet. 65% of the kids in school today are going to have jobs that no one's ever thought of before. And the most, um, the most in-demand jobs today didn't exist 10 years ago, and the pace is actually accelerating. This is a picture of junk food. <clears throat> it tastes good. Uh, but guess what? It's not really nourishing. And this is a picture of junk toys. They're actually really, really fun, but they're really low in cognitive and creative development. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I like junk food from time to time, and I think toys that are highly entertaining can be fun. But when our kids have so little time to play, we need to do things in moderation. We need to give them the things that are entertaining, that are the, the gifts under the tree that are exciting, and give them their endorphins. And then we need to also give them toys that allow them to think creatively, explore their, uh, their cognitive development, and think about things like technology, and programming, and, and solving problems. Kids eat what you give them, they play with what you buy them. Now, you may say, hey, this isn't a problem, and uh, let me tell you, the worldwide toy industry is about $80 billion. And if our kids are going to end up becoming cri critical thinkers uh, and start embracing fields and let's say science, technology, engineering, and math, you've heard that buzzword, STEM, then they need to play with those types of products in order to uh, expand their minds. Out of the $80 billion, less than $1 billion is uh, being spent on STEM-based toys that are technology-based. That's like going to a grocery store and 98% of the food is junk food. We make over 14 products at Sphero. A lot of them are products that are like really well known, like R2-D2 and BB-8, and they're fantastic robots, and they're really fun. They give you that endorphin rush of, of you know, the, the, the crazy new toy under the Christmas tree, but they have depth to them. They can be programmed. You can uh, learn about science and math and art. And this product here is the one I'm actually really proud about. It's our product that we designed for the school markets. It's called Spark for uh, students, uh, parents, robots, and kids. And over one million kids across the world are using this little guy to, uh, to learn about how to program. The kids are actually here painting with a robot. They first have to program it to drive into the paint and then draw a shape. So while they're having fun, they're also developing their cognitive thinking. So here's a quick video telling two kids talking about their experience with Sphero. Yeah. My grandmother does a robotics team, and I always kind of laughed at that because I really didn't get the point. And then I started programming Sphero, and I really, really liked it. It's because I got up close and personal with it, and also because Sphero was a lot of fun to play with. When I thought of programming, I thought of sitting in front of a computer, typing in code. This is like a whole lot different because we're actually like applying it to real world things. Very difficult to stay interested when you type in lines and lines of code without ever really seeing a return on the investment. It allows them to get kind of an instant gratification of their work. So there's one more story I want to share. And that's about a boy named Danny. It's not his real name, but I'll protect the innocent. And he's from southern Indiana, and he's a fifth grade student. And he's actually uh, comes from a, a pretty uh, disadvantaged home, and he's very disruptive in school. He lashes out, he gets in fights, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, do his homework, he's falling behind. And if he was left to the system, he would probably struggle the rest of his life. But thankfully, Danny had a science teacher. And the teacher felt that the standard way of teaching wasn't working. And so he, uh, he had access to our robots, and he brought them into the classroom, and Danny came to life. He started trying to figure out how to play with these things. He got to use the tablets and the computers, and he would, he would try to solve the problems, like drive the robot through the maze. And it was so transformative for this kid that the teachers thought to create a club that started at the, before school to invite other kids into so they can have the same experience that Danny did. Well, fast forward two years, and Danny is now showing up to school, right? He's a model student, he's unlocking the door, and he's teaching the other kids how to program. That's transformative, and that's because a teacher took the time to come up with a different way to deliver a subject matter to this young boy. Now, um, I purposely didn't... Uh, put a picture of my father in this presentation because uh, he's my hero. He's the one that gave me the gift of technology. He's the one that got me inspired uh, into becoming, uh, uh, pursuing a career in, uh, I guess, now making toys. Um, but he believed in education. He believed in a, a child becoming more than just a consumer of technology, but becoming a creator of technology. And if you think about my father being a hero for me, because he invested in me with the things he bought, I encourage you all to have an image of yourself. I encourage you to think about being the hero for some child. 
How are you going to get them engaged in technology? Because these are the jobs of the future. How are you going to bring their playtime to life so they become critical thinkers? Because it's our kids that are going to create all the new inventions of tomorrow. And we need them to be their best and brightest and most creative thinkers that they can be. So um, with that, thank you so much for having me here today. It's been an honor to be invited here.